Welcome to the Take the North podcast here on your Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm David Haw from 670 The Score, the Mullane and Haw Show. Dan Wiederer from the Chicago Tribune covers the Bears out at Hallis Hall the day after the aftermath of the Bears' 25-20 to 20 loss to the Philadelphia Eagles, best team in the NFL, worst team in the NFC. That's the way it broke down. Dan, on the radio on Monday morning around Chicago, there was a familiar sense of rationalizing this loss and looking for the positives and trying to look ahead. There wasn't a ton of surprise. I do, dare I say, feel like this is almost a conditioned response to losing. If the Bears aren't getting used to losing, the city certainly is. How's it going? It's going well. Um, I don't have a major problem today with the reaction to the loss of the Eagles. I thought the Bears, given how shorthanded they were, given the, the level of competition they faced, came with a competitiveness that you want to see down the stretch of the season. That game easily could have been a 27-point loss, and none of us would have batted an eye because of how much more talented uh, and, and deep and, and how much more momentum the Eagles have at this point. And so for the Bears to hang around, I think, was encouraging in a lot of respects. It was also encouraging, as we'll get into later in the show, to see your starting quarterback – meet that challenge and, and go up against a defense that's really, really opportunistic, really, really aggressive, and not look flustered really at any point during the day. And then obviously pull off a couple uh, a couple magical plays that show you who he is and what his gifts are as a playmaking artist. So uh, there is some of that. I, I, I do think that it will benefit everyone when we finally do get to January 10th and January 9th, whatever the day is that, that we officially uh, kind of walk out of these doors here at Hallis Hall for the last time for the 2022 season and just close the book on this because I think so many people's eyes are so far forward right now that this has become a formality in a lot of ways and there's little more moments of fun and then there's little moments of learning and there's little moments of struggle and all those things mixed in but but everyone is really just sort of fast forward to their brain to a brighter future that may or may not exist and and we'll, we'll we'll have to cover that as we go that's exactly what i guess i was alluding to it was neither a criticism nor a compliment it was just a matter of acceptance and there seems to be a yeah. common acceptance about what's going on here the bears now three and eleven haven't won a game since october 24th and so it has been eight long weeks and it might be even longer between victories that's uh understandable because this is what this this season has become about what i think we talked about in our post game pod and again i think you heard from matt eberflus today was yeah an acceptance of that but i don't think there's any satisfaction with the mini progress amid the bigger picture because he's a football coach he's been conditioned and trained to want to win these games well and one of the things that we talked about sometime in November, probably more than once, is that there, there, there are a lot of different conversations you can have about this football team at once. And so it's very easy to acknowledge the very significant and encouraging and promising growth that Justin Fields has made throughout the season, passing just about every test we've asked him to pass, except that last uh, fourth quarter drive that produces a win. We'll get to that on another show. And also recognize that this roster has so many flaws and so many whole team to go. What is troubling about the last few weeks is due to injury and performance struggles, you're seeing new holes pop up and new needs added to the list of things that Ryan Poles needs to address. And that's the last thing this team can afford because we can, we understand they're one of the, the bottom five teams in the league, if not one of the bottom two teams in the league. And you can't just keep adding to your list of needs with, oh no, we may need a right guard, a left guard, a kicker, another a depth piece in our receiving core, a kick returner, a punt returner, you know, you know like a pass rusher. The, 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 stop adding needs because you're going to have to address a lot of them, and it's going to be really difficult to do to get everything you need to, again, ultimately take advantage of a window of opportunity that your playmaking quarterback is going to open for you, right? I, I, I reflect back on the 2018 defense and what that – defense led by Khalil Mack did to open a championship window. And as we say in Chicago, windows of opportunity often come slamming shut like a guillotine blade, right? And they, they, they chop your head off if you're not careful. And so the last thing the Bears want to do is be like, oh, well, we'll get to it. Oh, well, we'll be patient. Our time will come. Justin Fields' time as a quarterback that can take you to heights that you've never experienced before is going to be short. And the, the, the opportunity to, to capitalize while he's on a, on a rookie deal is going to be shorter. And you better be ready to, to address all these needs and not let another window pass you by. Because, again, you, you remember all of the times, 2007, 2019, all these times where you felt like the Bears were on the cusp of something and they really weren't. And so hopefully the organization understands that on a day these pieces together. 
Ah, the old guillotine. Yes, let's get on to more <laughs> violent imagery in our opening drive. It's time for the opening, the, the, the opening drive. All right, Dan, so as you point out, attrition has been a factor, and it hit the Bears very hard. And so they have depth issues. Some of that will be alleviated at the running back position with the return of Khalil Herbert. Uh, Matt Eberflus talked about that. Let's start with the good news. Some Everybody wants a little good news this holiday week. Khalil Herbert returning is a good thing because I think it helps him compartmentalize that injury and also give them some help at a, at a pretty – uh, I, I don't want, it's not a need position, but certainly he was trending in the right direction when he went down. They've talked for a couple of weeks about how all the testing he's doing off to the side show that he is progressing to a point where uh, he looks great. Just all, all of the speed, agility, uh, explosion that you want to see out of a guy coming back off an of injured reserve from a hip injury is displaying. So now it's time to put that into action. The question comes on this short week where, where your practice schedule is going to be a little bit altered and you're not really going to have a normal – uh, Wednesday practice on a Tuesday, so to speak, coming towards a Saturday game is is just how much can you do to get Khalil Herbert back in football shape and, and how can you balance his workload through the practice week and then in the game plan going into Saturday just to make sure that you're doing him favors and doing the offense favors by structuring it properly. So that'll be interesting to see, but it, it, it's certainly encouraging that he'll get to play again this season. It's good for the Bears that they'll get a longer look at him over these final three weeks to, to make some what are going to be some difficult decisions about that position group going into the offseason of 2023 with David Montgomery's contract expire. And so so these are the types of moments that are, are notable for a team like this uh, to take. Speaking of health situations, uh, there are some scary moments Sunday at Soldier Field. Tevin Jenkins going down. Um, obviously, he was one of several players who had to leave and didn't return. Jack Sanborn, Jalen Johnson had some ribs uh, that were injured. There, there just have been too many times where you see a bear leave and not return. So what were some of the health uh, updates from Matt Eberflus? Yeah, the most notably on Tevin Jenkins, he continued to w use the word encouraging, said that Tevin was uh, released from the hospital on um, on say afternoon and was able to uh, get clearance there. And now he today is, is on Monday as we're recording, this is visiting some special trying to get uh, some second opinions and some cross check and some double checking done. Matt Eberflus didn't rule out the possibility that Tevin Jenkins would be this season, which to me seems like it's a, a little bit of a, of a long shot. Um, but certainly the team is going to push for that. And then the player is going to have to go make a, a personal decision that's best for him. But certainly when you see a guy leave on a, on a backboard, on a cart and be taken to an ambulance to be taken to a hospital, you fear the worst. And to get this news on Monday that, that Tevin is obviously uh, in, in, in much better shape than, than it originally looked like is, is very, very promising. In the moments after the game, Dan, I thought that Matt Eberflus sounded a very strong tone of accountability, whether it was Valus Jones fumbling, bothering him, and, and, and Eberflus saying basically you can't have that, he didn't like that, or even to the point when he was asked about Jaquan Brisker introducing the idea that he needs to be coached better, or maybe the assistant coaches need to bear some responsibility for a missed assignment on that blitz where he went to the wrong gap and Jalen Hurts recognized it and went to the other gap and scored. So I wonder 24 hours after the fact when Matt Eberflus has had a time and a chance to review the film and maybe take a deep breath, was there a difference in tone or how would you describe it? In regards to who specifically or just generally? Just generally because I think here we are 11 losses into this season and we be, uh, at least I find myself almost comparing ways that he has handled adversity. As I pointed out in the column on 670thescore.com, this is a franchise that one time, not that long ago, celebrated the enduring uh, perseverance it required to withstand a five-game losing streak as if that were something that was positive. I don't sense that kind of reaction from Matt Eberflus. And I guess after the game, he did seem like somebody who was you know, going to pick his spots and not, not try to placate or pander. But I wonder 24 hours later, was he in the same type of mood to not accept uh, much of anything. So I, I think it's case by case and player by player. I, and when you look at a guy like Valus Jones, like Matty Rufu spoke on Monday about the need to encourage a guy through adversity. And he was kind of pushed on that topic a little bit and asked, you know, you've tried this, you know, he's had adversity previously and you've tried the encouraging path and, and it hasn't really gotten you new results. Do you have to try something different? And his response was, look, with the encouragement comes challenge. And so at all times as a leader, as a coach, you have to take guys who are struggling and, and both encourage and challenge them. 
and that's that's a, a you know fine line and 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 something that you got to be delicate with. But they've got to figure out a way uh, man to man to to pull out the best in the guys that they have here. Right now, they're not getting the best out of Alis Jones, and it's very frustrating to this coaching staff. It's very frustrating to this team to have a guy they invested so highly not take them make the most of his opportunities and not not meet these challenges and so they've got to find a way around that um hopefully they can find that path with a guy like Jaquan Brisker you've seen him make mistakes but you've also seen him make plays throughout the year and so you can live with that a little bit more when a guy does make a, a, a few rookie mistakes but also is giving you everything you ask for in the hits principle and, and having a, a, a lot of other things that he can can play on this team's just got to find a way again to stay competitive and hopefully down the stretch of the season, identify some guys that can be bigger role playing difference makers for this team because there just aren't a lot of them on this roster right now. And you better start finding some of them in house because if you're counting on all of these guys to come from outside the building in 2023, I'm sorry, Chicago, you're going to be sorely disappointed when you wind up with a whole host of us, the guys. I don't think I would hand the ball to Bayless Jones again. I, I don't think that I would use him on a jet sweep or reverse. I, here's what I would do with him. I wouldn't put him deep on punts or kickoffs either because I just don't know. Or certainly not punts. Maybe kickoff returns. What I would do is I would try to incorporate him into the passing game. Even if he has marginal hands, you don't have many choices. Attrition has left you with this. The wide receiver room is sparse in terms of attendance. Bayless Jones can run a deep route. I know we saw on Sunday an example of maybe he didn't adjust that well to the ball. But I do think you got to try to use them because, Dan, you're right. You have to – you can't keep going to the street when you run out of players and finding guys to elevate. You need to find out what you have. Maybe they already know with Bayless Jones, but you did devote a third-round draft pick to get him, and I think that you have to try and exhaust every possible option and, and uh, experiment before the end of the season before you make a conclusion. Just to be fair, he did run a deep route in Dallas. Us and Justin put what would have been a uh, 50 yard gain right on his hands, and he dropped that one too. And so, right now, you've got a guy who's been drawn question from his coaching staff for being able to secure the ball, uh, both uh, you know, uh, on returns and, and handoffs, can't catch the ball on deep passes, and hasn't had uh, assignment sound uh, habits and consistency that has given them any confidence. And so, at this point, I think. You're just almost at a at a point where it's like I I don't know what you can expect for three more games to squeeze out of them, and you just got to kind of flip the page and 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 get to, again like we talked about in the opening, get to the end of this season and then, and then reassess things because it has not gone well. Um, what do we say? A th three yards uh, in, in two touches for three yards on Sunday afternoon, which brings them up to 75 yards from scrimmage for the season. I, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how much more you're going to squeeze out of them in the final three games. Hard to make a living using your hands when your hands aren't really that sure. That is the big problem right now. I had forgotten about the deep ball in Dallas. So <laughs> thanks for remembering. I'm sure that was in the interest of being fair. <laughs> The Bears exactly. coaches, the Bears coaches have not forgotten about yeah. that. I promise you. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the offensive line. Uh, six sacks against Hassan Reddick and the Philadelphia Eagles. You knew they were going to have a pass rush. I don't know what happened on the one-on-one -on -one Cole Komet Reddick uh, pass play. That was an embarrassment, and I think even Reddick chuckled post game in the locker room about, boy, he couldn't believe the Bears tried that. But overall, I don't think it was a good day for Alex Leatherwood. I'm not sure collectively you could point to the line. They ran the ball fine. Justin Fields will make a lot of mistakes, uh, look not as glaring because of his ability to make people miss. But where are the Bears with the offensive line with three games to go? Any big changes ahead? I mean, there's only so many changes you can make. I don't, you know, Matt Eberflus didn't sound super confident that that this rotation with, you know, last week he said, oh, yeah, we're going to stay in a rotation with Leatherwood and, and Reef at – right tackle this week on Monday afternoon. He said, we'll see, you know, we'll evaluate that as the week goes on. So in the 27 snaps that Alex Leatherwood has played over the last two games, I don't think he's won a whole lot of new opportunity from this coaching staff. Maybe he'll get a, a few more series against the bills on Saturday to try to, to, to sort things out, but they're not, they're not seeing enough across the board on their offensive line to, to, to feel good. And again, it's like, if we've determined that really you're going to need at least three, maybe five new wide receivers to bring, uh, that have potential to win a roster spot to training camp next year, you're, you're probably going to need a half dozen offensive linemen. And, 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 you know, Braxton Jones has been a nice story this year. But again, we've talked previously, if you can upgrade at the left tackle position, 
go for it. A little worrisome at times yesterday to see Cody Whitehair, who's supposed to be this, this veteran cement piece on your offensive line, who's a captain and, and supposed to be Mr. Reliable, have struggles the way he did. And you go, oh, God. Like, now is that something for 2023 that we've got to take a longer look at? Uh, Tevin Jenkins, he's hurt again. I, I, like, I know people have been really encouraged with some of the moments he's had at guard this year, but he missed most of his rookie season with an injury. And then this year he gets injured and then he's hurt at the start of training camp and then he gets injured in season. And then he's, you know, hurt enough to be active, but not play. And then he suffers another injury here. You know, at what point does durability and availability become a, a, a major question with 10? So I, I, I am all through 15 and there's not a lot of guys that you can lock in beyond, you know, fields, Mooney commit at this point. Wow. All right, last thing before we get into our QB1 segment, Matt Eberflus talked about, uh, at least this morning on or on Monday morning on WBBM, his interview that comes every week after Bears games, about the frustration with the non-call on Adamican Sue and the swipe he took at Justin Fields, which was egregious and unnecessary. But we are talking about Adamican Sue. Nobody's surprised. <laughs> Nobody at all. Especially this is just add Fields to the list of Bears quarterbacks that Sue has terrorized over the years and cheap shot it along the way. What did Matty Flu share, if anything, about the latest there and what the Bears can do to try to get some sort of response from the league? Yeah, he didn't share anything more on Monday afternoon. I think, you know, some of it is not just trying to seek, um, you know, explanation and, and <clears throat> excuse me, recourse from the league. It's being proactive enough before the game to to get in the ears of the officiating crew and say, listen, there are things that have been happening to our quarterback this year. That, that We've all seen basketball coaches you know, get in the ear of an official and, and, and buy a call or two just by, by saying, please look for this, please, please look for this. And then the next thing, you know, you've got something going in your favor that may, maybe creates uh, an awareness that then helps you going forward. We'll see where it goes. Um, again, I've said, you know, throughout the year, Justin's a difficult player to officiate because he is so slippery. He is so elusive. He is so capable of getting out of things that you don't want to completely handcuff a defense that's already got his work cut out in trying to stop a guy like this, but you have to protect him as well. And you have to be consistent league wide with how you make these calls. Um, yeah. I mean, you have to keep eyes on these things and, and, and that's, that's partly uh, obviously mostly the responsibility of the officiating crew, but partly the responsibility of the bears coaching staff to make sure that they're uh, at least bringing it to the officials attention so that it can be watched closely. Speaking of Justin Fields, let's get into our QB one segment. Okay, Dan, first category every week is the defining moment for Justin Fields. What was yours? I mean, it's the obvious one. It's yeah. it's the breathtaking, magical, playmaking artistry that Justin Fields shows in taking what looks like it's going to be a sack that's going to put the Bears in third and 34 and sets them up with first and goal at the nine and almost was a 48-yard touchdown run. When you can go in two breaths from facing third and 34 on your side of midfield to being one play from scoring a touchdown from inside the 10 of the opponent. It's amazing. And that's just who Justin Fields has become. He's one of the most electric playmakers in this league right now. I think to my time on this beat, and I think of Khalil Mack and I think of Devin Hester as two guys that just change games with how electric they can be that can, that can, in one moment can juice up an entire football team in one moment can juice up an entire stadium in one moment can flip something that looks like a disaster into a touchdown for your team. Right. And, 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 and to have that ability, it, it's unbelievable. It wasn't only fields having the strength and the agility to escape Hassan Reddick in the pocket. It's once he got out, it was almost like, you know, Reddick gets his arm around him and Justin uses it as a slingshot. And then he shoots in the open field and he shows you his elusiveness. And then he avoids a tackler. And then as impressive as anything was the spin move that didn't count after he stepped out of bounds because he, he, he showed that determination that he wasn't going to stop short of the goal line no matter what. He had every opportunity on that run to step out of bounds and, and, and call it a day and just kept fighting and sniffing for that goal line. It's special stuff. And the fact that it's coming so regularly, is it's worthy of celebration citywide. It's, it's, you're right. And that you couldn't have been put it much better. It, it's like when you watch Mahomes do what he does and, and create opportunities with his mobility and then his accuracy. It's like what Justin Herbert does when you see him drop it back in the pass in the pocket and throw a ball where only he can with the arm strength and the accuracy. Joe Burrow is another guy that comes to mind. When you think of these guys, 
and what they do is sort of their superpower. And they do draw you to the television screen and they're like, wow, I can't believe he did that. That's what Justin Fields is like when he's running the football. And that's not a knock at him throwing the football. But let's face it, when he's running the football, he does things that only a few other guys can do ever. And so that is his superpower. That's what makes him special. So my defining moment is related to what you said because he had a 39-yard run. He also hit the 1,000-yard uh, threshold, so that makes him a 1,000-yard rusher. The defining moment for me came after the game when at the podium, you know, everyone talks about Justin Fields and the intangibles. And it's really hard to articulate and to repeat, and it sounds redundant, but Justin Fields – was asked about being a thousand yard rusher and did he, you know, what that meant to him. He said it was special and he named all the right guys and the coaches and players and teammates. But the only thing that surprised me about how he took everything in stride with humility was that Dan, when he talked about not wanting to be a thousand yard rusher again, I think that yeah. is very interesting because number one, it's not like, okay, I just did this. Isn't this cool? Let's do it again. This is who I'm going to be. It was almost as if he already has processed the fact that that is cool. It's great. It's historic. And he may end up with the, the, the record by the time the season is over. But he's all right. Like he's had the internal questions about whether that's sustainable or whether that's the best thing for the Bears long term. If he is a perennial thousand yard rusher. Yeah, that may be OK. Maybe they can. But I think he's already thinking ahead and wondering about the wisdom of it because of the exposure to injury, because of what it means. Can you do this? And I just thought that was a presence of mind that really does define him as a leader. Well, I think he also understands what playing quarterback is about and particularly what playing quarterback in this league is all about. And he understands the need for, for growth in other areas, both from himself and the unit, the offense as a whole, that will help unlock him as a passer. Justin has been very clear for uh, a matter of weeks now that, that this wasn't his forte at any point in his life, really, before the season, which is kind of crazy. You go back through his college game logs. I think he had 200-yard rushing games in college, one at Georgia as a freshman and one at Ohio State. And so it's not like he was Lamar Jackson at Louisville running around every week and making all these 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 running plays. He was a, a pocket passer who did what he needed to do in the running game and, and, and gave that Buckeyes team what he needed in that dimension. But this is a whole different level in 2022, and he understands that that's not who he's been and it's not who he's going to be. And so that maturity is, is really good. At the same time, David, I thought it was really interesting that he knew he was 206 yards away from the all-time record record for quarterback rushing, which is Lamar Jackson. We'll get into that in a little bit and said, Hey, there's three games left. Why not go after it? So for three more weeks, he's going to have his, his running shoes on uh, as much as he can. I love that. He already did the math. He said it was about 70 yards a game and he's about right. And if he gets that, he'll break the record. All right. How about on the bright side, the next category? Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just gonna go to both of the touchdown passes because they highlight two different things for Justin Fields that are that are notable for me. The the, the first one to David Montgomery, they use a quick cadence. The Bears do and explain this after the game that it's just something where they can get up to the line, use a quick cadence, and not allow the defense to see what they're doing and react. And so Justin gets up there to use the quick cadence, but he also recognizes that Philly's going to be in a zero blitz and they're bringing the house against him. And it, in order to beat that, you've got to be quick, decisive, and know where your read is. And he goes right to Montgomery with a very simple pass, right? I think it's you know, maybe two yards beyond the line of scrimmage and it goes to the end zone. And that's the type of play that Matt Eberflus has been talking about. Last week, he told us, we've seen how dynamic Justin can be aforementioned in that run that we just talked about for five minutes. We want to see him make some of the ordinary plays more consistently. That's one of those ordinary plays. It's not anything that, that that's crazy difficult. It's not anything that's going to show up on your Twitter feed, but it is something that, that shows a quarterback's aptitude. It shows a quarterback's ability to respond, a, a quarterback's ability to make a quick and decisive decision. So that's a beautiful pass. And then you get the, the touchdown pass to, to Pringle late in the game, and you recognize that this is entirely a byproduct of how scared opposing defenses are of Justin beating them with his legs. And so he gets out of the pocket there, and he's, it's an off-script play. And now all of a sudden you've got a bunch of guys in the secondary coming to charge up because they don't want to be embarrassed and put on another highlight reel loop. And the next thing you know, you've got a receiver standing at the two-yard line with no defender within two zip codes of them, and it's the easiest touchdown pass you've got. Pringle said after the game, I had to concentrate extra hard because I was so wide open. It goes for a touchdown, but it's a touchdown because of what Justin does with his legs that scares the hell out of opposing defenses. Those are the easiest yards after a catch Byron Pringle has ever had. 
because he basically waltzed into the end zone, didn't go very fast. And it was, uh, yeah, just a matter of he, he, he don't drop it because it was right there. I'm going to stick with that play for my uh, uh, on the bright side because I do think that for the second game in a row is very similar to me. I know different circumstances and different receivers, but when Justin Fields scrambles now, you don't worry so much about him keeping his eyes down the field. He has done that better, and he has whether that's an, a point of emphasis or a coaching. You, you know, you talk about coaching and. And that that's a evidence of coaching. Justin Fields scrambles and he's keep looking for that player, that player to break open. And the receivers now are used to that. Good things happen. And um, he, he was able to make a play because of that, where I think 10 weeks ago, I wonder if that would have been the case. And certainly last year, I doubt it. So he scrambled, bought himself some time, looked downfield, then put the ball where it needed to be, and Pringle did the rest. Two plays before that magical run that we talked about, he hit a, uh, a, a again, a climb the pocket, slide out to the right, and just drop a little dump off to David Montgomery. It goes for 21 yards. Prime example of what you're talking about there, of, of having the eyes up and not activating the, the legs before you need to, and you get – experience when you see success doing that you compile these plays where it's like oh this is pretty easy i just dropped this off to david he'll get us 21 we'll get a new set of downs we'll move the chains and we'll see what we can do this is all stuff that is you, you know we asked in september and early october to see market progress out of this young quarterback he's shown us market progress for the last two months and, and it gives again we talked about it it opens up the box to dream and that's what I think Chicago is doing right now. Now there's another box sitting in the corner that says, here's your Santa scroll worth of needs for 2023. Get some of these addressed. But again, Fields is, is, is answering the bell every single week. There still are always going to be some uh-oh moments. What was yours yesterday? <laughs> it's the fourth quarter. You're down by four points. You're deep in your own territory. And you've got a third down play coming up. And your quarterback gets up after a run and he's st st stuck on the field. And he's stuck on the field with what looked like a leg injury and turned out to be cramping. And he's got to leave the field. He's got to go to the tunnel. And it leaves you in a four-point game in the fourth quarter at home against a really good opponent to have Nathan Peterman throw a pass to Simba Webster on third and 13. It goes incomplete. You punt. And while your quarterback goes and gets his IV treatment and comes back to, to, to throw a touchdown to Byron Pringle on the next series, in between there, you had a punt. You gave the Eagles the football. They marched for a touchdown and put the game out of reach. Again, we talked about this on our post-game podcast on Sunday evening. At some point, these games and the results of these games are going to matter more to a lot more people, and the stakes are going to be more meaningful, and your quarterback cannot be dealing with consistent issues with cramping. Justin says he's got to get an IV bag before every game. Somebody in this organization has to make sure he gets that IV bag before every game. Somebody's probably got to shove four bananas in his locker <laughs> at halftime. Right? Like, let's, let's exhaust every option to make sure that he doesn't need cramping treatment down the late stages let's, of close games. Let's do better. Okay. He, I, I know he has great agents. I know they look out for his best interests, but Chiquita banana. Okay. Justin Fields is waiting for you. Whatever <laughs> banana organic, organic bananas, whoever the case may be, there is a, there is a pitch man. There is an endorser waiting for you because he needs the potassium Chicago. Let's do the guy a solid and let's give him a banana to endorse. One last, one less vegan donut at Duncan. You know, one less uh, burrito at Chipotle and something that gets the, the electrolytes up and the cramping to stop. Because, again, like, hopefully this is a two-game thing and we never talk about it again. You know, hopefully they get it solved right away. But the next time he cramps is a third time. And strike three, you're out, and somebody's got to pay for that. Uh, that, that I, didn't, I didn't love that because it was, again, it was a critical, a critical moment of a close game. And, you know, again, you, you, Matt Eberfuss asked him about it on Monday afternoon. He said, yeah, that was a little stressful. And, you know, it was the understatement of the year having to, to throw Nathan Peterman out there to, against the Eagles to throw a pass to Simba Webster. It's not August. It's the, it's, it's a one score game at third and long. And you have Nathan Peterman thrown into Simba Webster. That is a preseason connection in primetime action. That's what you don't want. That's a good one. I have two uh -oh moments and it's not, it's not, we, we've praised him a lot, but there's just two little things. If I'm reviewing the tape or watching it again, as I began to do before this podcast, those lateral passes at the line of yeah. scrimmage I referenced after the game, I don't know what it is, but it almost like he hesitates and it's already in his head because he's got to throw lateral and he's not throwing down the field. And I don't know. It's like, it's like a great three point shooter that can't hit a free throw or who's a 60% free throw shooter, but boy, you know, he can really nail the three. I don't know what, if it's too 
orchestrated or too safe of a pass, but he struggles still with these side sidearm lateral passes to the, that are bubble screens. I don't know why, but every time he does that, I think, uh-oh, because it's going to be more difficult to complete than it needs to be. Wednesday of this week, we will get both Luke Getze and quarterbacks coach Andrew Dinoco. It's on my question list because we should get some sort of detailed explanation from these guys who work with them every day to figure out what's going wrong and what the troubleshooting method is. Uh, and we'll, we'll we'll try to bring some answers and clarity to that because it is it's become an every week thing, and that's yeah. that's where it comes up worthy. So the second one is is a little bit more defined or specific. So it's third and sixteen at the Eagles twenty. And you, this is before the I can't make it from 30 yard, uh, the 30 yard line decision by Cairo Santos, which talked Matt Eberflus into uh, or out of trying a field goal and trusting his kicker. I'll get to that in a moment. But um, so it's third and 16 at the 20. Justin Fields takes a 10 yard loss on third down. Now, Hassan Reddick is running him down, and this is a guy that is has bad intentions. I get it. This is a very accomplished pass rusher it's easy to say throw the ball away but I think if you're coaching him you've got to say throw the ball away they lost 10 they took themselves out of field goal range the only for the third or the first time in three years the Bears decide to punt at the 30 yard line goodness sakes was that a decision but they were put in that spot because I think Justin Fields needs to get rid of the ball even though they have someone coming down at him it, you have to maybe – it's easy to say anticipate it better, but that was the one where I went a little bit like, oh, it went through my mind, uh-oh, he should have probably thrown that away. There's an expert level of situational awareness there as well because at some point your quarterback's also got to understand what scoring range is on a given day and, and make sure that whatever you do, you don't retreat out of scoring range. Uh, I obviously got fired up after the game on Sunday talking about a team that um, you know got to the 14-yard line and punted. I got more fired up rewatching it on Monday, just thinking like, how, you know, how does that happen? How are you inside the red zone and end that drive with a punt? Um, so yeah, that's definitely, definitely notable. As I said this morning on Monday morning on the radio, it's like in Hoosiers when they asked Jimmy Chitwood during that timeout. Okay. And Jimmy says, I'll make it. <laughs> it's like Cairo Santos. They say, what do you think? He'll say, I can't make it. Who does that? Who does <laughs> well, that? And, and, and you know, Brad Biggs got into it in his 10 thoughts with, with Cairo changing where he's kicking his extra points from now. He's yeah. been on the right hash all year, and now he's moving to the middle, and there's something visually that's messing with his head. And, um, you know, I talked about it on, on 670 The Score on Monday afternoon. It's like it's like tinkering with your golf swing. And, and if, if you keep messing around with things, you just introduce things in your head that are – not supposed to be there. And the more things you have in your head, the, the, the less confident and, and uh, you know, sure you are that you can get it done. cairo has got to get that cleaned up. He really has to finish the season on a, on a stretch here where he has three really good games so that they don't have to go into 2023. With him on the Santa scroll. Last category for QB1, the big number. What's yours? 207. It's the number of rushing yards Justin has left to surpass Lamar Jackson as the NFL single season all-time leading rusher. I thought it was notable that he passed Bobby Douglas in game 14 for the Bears because that's how many Bobby Douglas did it in 50 years ago. It's like Robert Quinn last year breaking Richard Dent's sack record in game 16 instead of game 17. It gives it a little bit more credibility. You know, now Justin's on a, 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 an even playing field with Bobby Douglas. He's got an extra game to, to go past what Lamar Jackson did in 2019. But it's right there, right? You need to average 70 a game basically uh, to get there. And he's been over 70 pretty much every week for the last six or seven weeks. Uh, not something they're going to go out of their way to, to, to make happen. But I would bet you that if he's on the doorstep in, in uh, you know, week 18 in Minnesota, there's going to be a few extra chances for Justin to go ahead and, and get that record to put the punctuation on the season. Um, you know, it, it, it'll be special punctuation on, on a special year that we'll be t- talking about here for a long time. Ultimately, you would hope one of these special individual performances is accompanied by success that makes it feel better. Uh, but for right now, we don't have that to, to work with, so we'll work with what we've got. My number would be 119.5. Typically, I'm not a big passer rating guy, but I do think this week it reflects exactly what went on, and that is the passer rating, in fact, takes into account how much and how well you protect the football. And Justin Fields protected the football against the league's most aggressive defense in terms of taking it away. And when you play uh, the Philadelphia Eagles and you know that you're going to be in for a long day, 
He was sacked six times and yet did not throw an interception, knowing that pressure was coming. And I think that shows some growth as well because those errant throws were avoided somehow. And that number reflects that because if you protect the football, those numbers will stay high. You know, the passing numbers aren't what you wanted to be, 152. He was 14 to 21, efficient enough and accurate, two touchdowns. But really the big number to me was the lack of interceptions uh, against a defense that is not afraid to jump routes and is going to collapse the pocket and make you throw it where you don't want to. And he avoided those kind of mistakes, and I think that was significant. What, did not appear frantic at any point during the game Sunday, and that's the biggest victory of any victory that the Bears could have taken out of that because it's just a sign that he's comfortable now. And I, I, I've said this in the last couple of weeks, that when you get that calm and comfort that Justin's talked about here over the last month, that puts you on an escalator toward – command and once you get quarterback command you're on a new floor as, as an nfl quarterback and, and it's it's a nice thing to be on that escalator <laughs> and to try to get there so we'll see where they take this all right let's wrap things up with a look ahead all right dan so a lot of things to cover in this final segment but i think let's start with the weather forecast yeah uh, I, I was just looking at this for those watching this on video there it is my weather app it, you, you don't know if you're going to be Buffalo or Chicago. The Bills will feel right at home in what could be blizzard conditions coming to Chicago late in the week. There will be a white Christmas, so kids, you're going to be happy, but it might be really, really white, and <laughs> I think that could be a problem. Blankets of snow expected, temperatures in single digits, Dan. What did uh, Matt Eberflew say about preparations and how they will uh, brace for the chilly weather? Didn't get to it yet, but we're looking right now at a high of eight. I don't know what the wind chill is going to be. This 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 snowstorm uh, has a, uh, the potential to disrupt the Bills traveling here. You know, they may have to, to to alter their travel plans to try to get here on Friday for a Christmas Eve game. It's going to be really interesting. Hopefully, Bears fans will uh, take note of what they what they watched this past Saturday night and and keep the snowballs in the stands. Throw them at each other. Please don't throw them at players and coaches. It's not a good thing. Uh, the Bills obviously dealt with that against the Dolphins in that wild game on Saturday night that they won. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, you, you talk about uh, you know starting the year with that monsoon against the the 49ers and then obviously ending the calendar year uh, at home against the, the the Bills in a game that could also have some some really really photographically cool moments for for the folks at, the, at my outlet to to take some snapshots of of the players playing around in the snow. I'd like a ruling from you and wonder what kind of conversation was created at Hallis at all at the day after. But uh, if I were, uh, if you were on the stand and I was a, a prosecutor or an attorney <laughs> questioning you, not guilty. Yes or, yes or no. Yes or no. One word answer. Did Jalen Johnson have a good football game Sunday against the Philadelphia Eagles? All right. So I actually neglected to, to say this in the opening it is the holiday season, and I feel like I owe you and Studs both uh, at least a half apology uh, for, for our post-game pod on Sunday evening. I think I was a little harsh on both of you with my Dikembe Mutombo wagging the finger. You said that, that Justin Fields played better than Jalen Hurts, and I, I jumped back a little too aggressively on that one. Uh, and, and in re-watching Jalen Johnson's performance against A.J. Brown, uh, to Stud's point, and and he can slap me in the face the next time he sees me, or do it over Streamyard uh, on on the video app that we use here if he if he must. Uh, Jalen was competitive, and the numbers didn't quite um, show how well he played at times against AJ Brown. The Eagles just went after uh, Jalen Johnson a lot, and you would like to see that better. Like I, I'm still never going to forgive an 181 yard performance by an opposing receiver particularly when the number two receiver, Devontae Smith, also went over 100 yards. You got to shut down somebody at some point and, and, and make them go elsewhere with the football. Um, but I, I do think re-watching it, you see a level of competes, you see a level of playmaking, you see a level of, of confidence and, and edge to Jalen Johnson that's worth noting. And that was probably a little too harsh post game. So sorry to studs. And then also sorry to you for, for being so uh, – Matumbo we on the, the field saying, because again, watching that back, the victory and comfort and calm that he had against that defense is it, it's truly impressive. That's no problem. All right. That's good. That's interesting. I, I just think that the Jalen Johnson thing fascinates me because I found myself being more supportive and encouraging and accepting of a guy who gave up, gave up 181 yards <laughs> to his receiver who was targeted 16 times. That was the highest production from an opposing bears receiver in nine years. 
And, and, and yet I feel like Jalen Johnson could feel good about his performance, which is an odd thing to say. Who was the last one nine years ago? I, I cannot recall now. I, uh, boy, I'm going to have to check that out. I, I, I would have been on the beat. Yeah, that, that, yeah just for, for cross-referencing. 2013, though. I'll double-check that. I like, um, to, I like to relive some of those, those scars in my coverage. So I wanted to also – we talked so much about the defensive front not being up to standard this year and how difficult it has been for that group in the front seven. Um, even to the point where I think I refer to them as the worst in football. And that's, you know, everyone has their moments. But so when they play well, I think you have to give credit. And individually, Mike Pinnell had a very strong game. Did he stand out? Did he receive any praise from Matt Eberflus? No, his name was not mentioned on Monday. He did, did force that fumble that Kyler Gordon recovered. Um, deserves credit for that, for ripping it out, for being uh, aggressive throughout the day. That's another veteran placeholder you've got there. Uh, again, that defensive line – Brad Biggs asked me a question before the game, and then in the first quarter, he said, "When's the last time that you like starred a play in your notebook that Al Quadine Muhammad made?" So right. I don't know that I've it, right, and so so this is where where the the belief that the Bears are just going to roll through free agency and bring people that are, are are seven levels above what they have now into the building at five different positions is it's just unrealistic. And you're just going to wind up with a different variation of some of these guys. And then you've got to figure out a way to, to coach and scheme and squeeze the best out of them. Um, that's a, just a side tangent, but it was, it was just one of those moments where you're like, right, like where have some of these guys been all year? Do you expect the bears to bring in any kickers to take a look at before the end of the season? Uh, in, in place of Cairo Santos, or is that just one thing they don't want to have to worry about in the offseason? I wouldn't mess with it right now. There, there, there's really nothing at stake. And, and, and so you've got an opportunity to do this in the spring, the summer, if you lose confidence in Cairo Santos. Just, introducing it now, I think, just creates something that doesn't need to be created at this stage of where they're at. You try to hope Cairo's a pro, a veteran. He can work through these things and get himself back on on, on steady ground. Uh, the last thing you also want to do with with two games left in Chicago is, is tr try to bring in a new guy to start his tenure as a Bear, kicking in the conditions at Soldier Field, which, as you know, take a long time to get used to. So in 2013, Dan, to, to close the loop, Antonio Brown had 196 yards against the Bears receiving, and that was the highest total um, until AJ Brown, uh, wow. 181 yesterday. That was a so, that was a big victory by the Bears. I think that was the one that took them to three and zero. To I think you're right. To Mark Tressman here, if I'm saying, yeah. Antonio, big Brown catch in the back of the end zone. Mm -hmm. Cutler to Earl Bennett to, to win that game at the end of that. Wow, one. that is quite a Vanderbilt memory and a connection. And Antonio Brown had 196 receiving yards and even left his shirt on. <laughs> so I think that was quite the memorable afternoon. Okay, so before we wrap it up, the other guys I wanted to mention on defense, Dan, I know they probably didn't come up, but uh, without Jack Sanborn now, I don't know how long he'll be out, but you did see more obviously, I know he's been a steady pro, but Nick Morrow led the team with 11 tackles, nine solos, and um, he was active. And Joe Thomas had six tackles, and I guess that Matt Adams will be the third guy. If Jack Sanborn can't go, those are your three linebackers. Joe Thomas uh, drew special mention from Matt Eberflus for uh, being willing to hit. And he had that one big shot on Jalen Hurts when Jalen Hurts snuck through the middle and was in the open field. And <laughs> Joe Thomas put a lick on him. That was something that Matt Eberflus made mention of and said, I like these guys that can hit. So he's going to have a, a, a maybe an expanded window of opportunity. We don't know where, where things will go with Sanborn this week. So why can't the Bears cover kicks for the third time in the last five games? The kick returner averaged 30 yards per return. Is that a source of concern for Eberflus and company? Well, part of it is because you're dealing with a lack of depth. And when you start bumping depth pieces up into starting roles and moving other guys into special teams roles, now all of a sudden you're just dealing with a short deck. And the Bears have been dealing with it all year. They've been trying to bring young guys along. They don't have a, a team that is good enough to fortify that third phase. And that's, that's just part of this process of trying to become a team that's relevant again. And, and this year uh, they're just, they're just shorthanded, you know, talent wise and depth wise, they don't have the pieces and this is what happens. It becomes a ripple effect and it shows up in, in areas where sometimes you're paying attention. Sometimes you're not. I think we covered a lot of ground, anything that we overlooked, anything you wanted to include before we uh, wrap things up. Yeah, no, I, you know, it's a, it's a, a week here that's going to be strange in a lot of different ways because of the Saturday kickoff, because of the weather at the end of the week, because of the injuries, because of all these things. Bears are going to have to deal with some flux here, and they're going to have to show a level of uh, 
championship habits, which Matt Eberflus has been bringing up quite uh, frequently here uh, in the last few weeks, and, and, and they'll have to try to develop a few more of those in, in what's going to be a demanding week. Even with the Saturday game, we will drop our podcast, Take the North, on Friday. You can get it on your free Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast, download, listen, and subscribe. You can also see us on YouTube, on the Odyssey's YouTube channel. Uh, We're starting to do that, getting a lot of good feedback and and interaction with with you. That way, you can also reach us on Twitter, at Take the North Pod, whenever you want to reach us, at Dan Wiederer or at David Haw on Twitter as well. Yeah, so I think we're going to have kind of a compressed week here, kind of uh, wait and see what happens. And the Buffalo Bills and Josh Allen come into town with another point of comparison, another quarterback that will draw some parallels to Justin Fields only because of the way Fields, uh, the Josh Allen struggled early and now is an MVP candidate. And well, listen, if you get bored at the end of the week and want to stop by and help shovel the driveway, I will not turn you down. I know you've been offering to do that for a little while. So, so swing on by. We've got extra shovels, always do, and uh, you can help us get it uh, cleared out. I broke down a couple winters ago and got a snowblower for a reason. My shoveling days are limited. My back says things. Well, I'm going to be using the, the snowblower. You, you okay. Can use the yeah. We, okay. We, we, we bought the snowblower in Minnesota, which is, uh, you know, that's like a purchase. Like you, you, you move in, uh, you know, on August 30th, getting ready for an NFL season. You say, let's get to Lowe's and buy a snowblower right away because you never know when it's coming. I don't know if I'll be available, but I think I, uh, Brad Biggs would be willing and able and, and to help you out if you need to. All right, I'll call him. He still uh, owes me about five or six lawn mowings that he's promised. Hasn't sure. done those. So. Sure. All right. For Dan Weeder, <laughs> I'm David Haw and Adam Stadzinski. Thank you for listening to the Take the North podcast. We will talk to you again on Friday. Great talk. See you out there.